Welcome to this week's Wednesday webinar. Um, as usual, this is also being live streamed to YouTube um, and we're making a recording. So if anyone misses part of it, it'll be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, and also we'll be doing the Q&A at the end of the presentation, which you can do by writing questions in the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, and you can write buttons as we go along, write questions as we go along, which we'll then come to at the end. Uh, this week, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Folks, the director of the BAA Saturn, Uranus and Neptune section, who are talking about observing Saturn in 2020. Over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Andrew, and welcome to this British Astronomical Association webinar on observing Saturn in 2020. Hope everybody's keeping safe during this pandemic, and certainly where I am now, it's an absolutely gorgeous sunny day, and hopefully it'll be clear tonight. I suppose for many amateurs, I uh, like to look at Saturn to see its rings. And as the planet will be in opposition in a few weeks' time, it's probably timely to look at what we might see over the few months on Saturn, whether you've got a large telescope or a small one. So what tonight we're going to do is don't really know where to find Saturn, we're going to look how we can find Saturn. Then I'm going to have a look at what we can see, whether you're observing visually or imaging on the planet, obviously the rings, the planet itself and its satellites. I'm not going to be talking about image in very much, although we've got Martin Lewis online, who's one of the UK's best images, maybe to answer any questions. And if you are interested in how to image both Jupiter and Saturn, there's an absolutely excellent article in this uh, July edition of Astronomy Now by the BAA's own David R. Ditty. Um, and then I'm going to look at the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, which is quite a few months ahead, but it's good to plan. And then we'll find that atmospheric dispersion can cause a little bit of a problem if you're observing with colour cameras or visually. And Martin is going to do a very brief presentation how we can overcome this. And then we'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got. So, Hi Mike, this is Andy. Just to let you know, yeah. we're getting a little bit of break up on your microphone. It okay. might be an idea. You could try turning off your camera and see if we'll see if that, that might solve the problem. Ah, dear, just a minute. Can you, is it breaking up now? Not at the moment, but it was coming whilst you were doing your introduction. There were a few moments of breakup, then it would go clear. OK, then well, let, let's continue. Up. Just I've, I've yeah. moved near the microphone, so let's continue and see how we go. So Saturn is in opposition on July the 20th at 2200 hours. And if what is opposition, I'm sure many of you know what this is. But as we can see in this diagram, it really means that the sun Actually, and the Earth... Mike, we're getting a bit of breakup again. What I suggest you try is if you go to the top of your screen and then to the left, you'll see a button which will kind of turn off your video. I okay. think give that a go because that will reduce what you're sending over the internet connection. Okay, I'm just trying to get the Zoom thing up at the present moment. Right, uh, audio, I've got audio on, stop video. There we go, try that. That's it, we'll give that a go. Thanks Mike, sorry to interrupt okay. you. Sorry about that. I haven't, let's go back. So Saturn is opposition. This means that the Sun and the Earth are in a line. This diagram is not to scale, but it means that Saturn is opposite the Sun in the sky. And we're on the meridian at midnight for your midnight in local geographical longitude terms. And it'd be effectively at its closest and its brightest. Obviously, as the Earth moves around in its orbit, the separation increases between opposition and conjunction. But for Saturn, the angular change isn't that great. So um, there's no, no real worry about that. Also, some oppositions are closer than others, but we're a few years away from when Saturn is its closest to the Sun. So this could be considered a medium class opposition. Where is Saturn in the sky? Well, here is a, a, a simulation of opposition night on the 20th to 21st. And Saturn, the immediate thing is that Saturn lies to the east of Jupiter. And Jupiter is very bright, it's about minus one, 2.5. Saturn's quite a bit fainter, but it provides a useful guide for finding Saturn. And the two planets lie very close to the border between Sagittarius and Capricornus. We've got the asterism, the teapot asterism of Sagittarius and the two bright stars, Alpha and Beta and Capricornus. 
And this is a view taken from a random location in the UK. I've chosen Birmingham without the light pollution. And the obvious thing is that even on the meridian, it's not particularly high. And its maximum altitude is just under 17 degrees, which is not particularly high at all. If we move further north, and if we look at, say, Aberdeen in Scotland, an equivalent latitude through the world, this is about 57 degrees, Saturn is even lower. It's at 12 degrees. And certainly with its platinum planet's detonation, uh, anywhere sort of 69 or 70 degrees north on the Earth, Saturn won't rise at all. Conversely, if we move southwards, its maximum altitude will increase. And certainly if you live close to the Tropic of Capricorn, it would be very high indeed. And if we were living in Sydney or maybe um, Cape Town or Buenos Aires, the planet would be sort of nearly, 75, uh, nearly 80 degrees high. And wouldn't that be very nice? The low altitude that we're experiencing in north temperate latitudes has a couple of problems, really. First of all, the planet doesn't stay high in the sky for all that long, maybe six or seven hours. And also, we are looking through a thicker air mass than if the planet was overhead. And this has three consequences. Firstly, um, if the atmosphere is disturbed in any way, i.e. the seeing is bad, we're looking through a lot worse, a lot more bad seeing. So often as not, when things are low down, the seeing can be poor. Though sometimes in um, this time of year, you can sometimes get some really good night seeing. The second thing is we're looking through a thicker air mass. It actually dims the image a bit. And certainly between, say, having a, the planet at, say, 45 degrees and, say, 10 degrees altitude, we're certainly going to lose at least a magnitude in brightness. And that gets worse for even lower altitudes. And this has an implication, particularly when observing satellites. The third consequence of being low altitude is that the air acts as a small prism. And this splits the light out, red, green, blue. And this has an impact on, produces colour fringes and probably reduce your resolution. And Martin is going to give a short presentation on how we can actually overcome this. So, if we've got our telescopes out, look at Saturn, what can we see? Well, we can also compare, as the two planets are close together, and compare Jupiter and Saturn. And this is a, a view of Jupiter taken a few nights ago. We see the belts, the dark bands, the zones, the light bands, and some dark projections in the North Equatorial Belt. And I've orientated this in a classical astronomical telescope in the Northern Hemisphere, which has south at the top, north at the bottom, west on the left side, which is sometimes called the preceding side, and east on the following side. Jupiter would be about four astronomical units away. That's four times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And quite a respectable, almost 48 arc seconds across. Saturn, however, is a bit smaller. It's uh, smaller than Jupiter and much further away. It's at nine astronomical units away. And although the rings, angular diameter of the rings, will be comparable to Jupiter, the actual disk size is a lot, lot smaller, about just under 19 arc seconds across. But this view of Saturn, um, so a few nights ago, I've tried to reduce to mimic the view through quite a small telescope. And it resembles the view I had with a 90 millimeter telescope last year under not particularly good conditions. And even then you can see that it's got bands, colored zones like on Jupiter, we've got the rings, and we can also see the rings are not uniform in brightness. The outer part of the rings is a little bit darker. So if we've got a telescope or we're imaging, what can we hope to see over the next few months? And to illustrate this, I'm showing Four images, uh, quite high resolution images. Um, these are probably better than you see with a small telescope, but just to illustrate a few points. I've got an image by Martin taken last year, and the reason for its inclusion I'll come to in a few minutes. We've got three images that have come into the Saturn section, one by Mark Longsdale, Peter Tickner, and Mike Hood. And it's interesting to note that Peter's image was taken by the largest telescope of these three and was taken in the UK. Mike's is taken in Georgia in the States where the planet is a bit higher. And Mark was taken, the image was taken in Australia. And you can probably see that perhaps he had much better seeing than Peter did. Let's begin with the rings. Uh, as we said earlier, the rings are not uniform, they vary in brightness. 
and there's an outer ring which looks greyish or bluish, which is ring A. The brightest ring that we can see is ring B, and these are separated by the famous Cassini division. What aperture you need to see this? Well, it will depend upon the seeing. I've certainly seen it with the 80, 90 millimeter aperture class, if the seeing is good and the rings are wide open as they are now. Certainly larger telescopes, if the seeing good, may be able to trace this quite a way around the ring system, but it's well worth looking out for. There is a third ring that can be seen by amateurs, and this is ring C, and it's faintly visible on Martin's image and on some of the other images as well. But this is quite a struggle to see visually. However, we can see where the rings cross the planet. Ring C is quite tenuous, but actually make, looks like a small dark band crossing the inside of ring B. And if we go um, back an image to so this one, you can see it just vaguely here on this image as well. So it's something that might be able to be picked up with a small telescope. Ring A has some detail in it, which again, you need perhaps larger telescopes and good seeing to see, but perhaps the easiest thing to find is that the inner edge of ring A is a lot brighter than the outer edge. And indeed, this boundary was sometimes in the 19th century thought to be a true division or gap in the rings, but it's just a, a change in intensity. You'll notice there's also some ripples intensity in here on Martin's image, and they're not divisions either. It's again, it's just changes in intensity. And there is actually a true division which requires high resolution to see, which is now labeled the anchor gap. Ring B can sometimes be seen as varying in intensity, and certainly its inner edge can be a little bit more shaded and darker than its outer edge. Now, Saturn is a non-luminous object and casts a shadow into space. It actually projects its shadow onto the rings. At opposition, the shadow will lie behind the planet, so we can't see it. But at other times, we can see a little bit of this ring shadow. Before opposition, it will appear on the preceding side or the western side of the ring system. And after opposition, we can see Martin's image, it will appear on the following side. And this will get a maximum after solar conjunction when the Sun, the Earth and Saturn are at 90 degrees, the angle between is 90 degrees, and then it starts to narrow again as we get towards opposition. And we can see in these images by Mark, Peter and, Tickner, um, and Mike, the shadow is actually starting to narrow as we get towards opposition, and after opposition it will appear on the following side. The rings, although made up of countless thousands and millions of particles, actually cast their shadow onto the planet itself. And I'm sure many of you must have seen this in the fantastic images from the Cassini spacecraft. If the Earth went round the sun in the same plane as Saturn, we would never see this from the Earth, apart from darkness in Cassini's division when it's projected onto the planet. However, the two planet's orbits are not coplanar. They tilted by just over two degrees or so. So sometimes the Earth is to the south of the ring plane and sometimes it's a little bit further to the north. And during this apparition, certainly in April, the Earth was well south of the ring plane. We actually can see a little bit of the southern hemisphere. And here we can see it's divided by the shadow of the rings onto the globe. As the apparition goes on, the Earth is actually slightly moved slightly more north of the uh, Saturn's orbital plane. And so the rings will open up a little bit more and we we'll, won't be able to see this bit of the northern hemisphere too well. However, the ring shadow will start to appear where ring C crosses the planet. And sometimes this can make this part of ring C appear very dark indeed. Also on the planet itself, it shows zones and belts like Jupiter. But visually, I've found that these can be a little bit of low contrast and perhaps not too easy to see. But certainly with imaging, with a bit of enhancement, you can bring out a number of belts and zones. But certainly with a sort of 90, 100 millimeter aperture telescope, I think you'd be very unlucky to see the main belt, which is designated the North Equatorial Belt. And sometimes you might be able to pick out a few other belts as well. Often as not, this area looks greyish at low resolution. But certainly high resolution images have been able to pick out quite a few belt details, including this feature, which is the famed North Polar Hexagon. 
probably seen with relatively medium telescopes at reasonable seeing, but to see the actual vertices does require high resolution. If you're lucky enough to have clear skies around the time of opposition, there's something that's called the opposition effect. And I've certainly seen this with a 150 mil aperture telescope, but you may be lucky to see this with even smaller telescopes. But what seems to happen um, around there to around time of opposition, the brightness of the ring seems to surge in brightness. It's very, very distinctive. And this is shown in some images taken by Niall McNeil last year. And this is the standard appearance of the rings, but this is the increase in brightness, particularly with ring B, around the time of opposition, which was July the 9th last year. What is the mechanism that produces this? Well, there are two ideas. One is where the ring particles cast shadows on other ring particles, and then the shadows get hidden at opposition. But probably more likely effect is these ice particles reflect light backwards towards the sun preferentially when the sun and the earth are lined up. One thing you may have noticed is that when I showed a picture of Jupiter earlier, there were sort of features in the atmosphere. Jupiter has its great red spot. There are some very dark projections visible and other storm or weather features, if you like. But on the images I've shown so far of Saturn, apart from the belts and zones, it looks, many people use the term bland. There's a slight brightening here, but Storms, weather features do exist on Saturn. They can be seen, but realistically, they do require the larger amateur telescopes to see. Um, so let's see some examples. These are a couple of images, excuse me, of some of the features that have been detected over the last few years. And in fact, many features over the last 100 years have been seen on Saturn. The Equatorial region sometimes produce bright spots, which you can see here. And the southern hemisphere in the south temperate latitudes produce quite violent storms. Fortunately, they, when Cassini was operating, Cassini found that these types of storms were actually gigantic thunderstorms, um, Earth-sized thunderstorms. And these tended to last a few months, then disappear, and a new one would appear. And often as not, we can see a little bit of disturbance in the planet's atmosphere caused by these storms. And it's one of the things that the section tries to do is monitor Saturn to see if there's any storms or other features appearing and how they evolve and their timescales they take to evolve. It will be interesting to see when the Southern Hemisphere comes back into view in a few years time, if storms still persist at this latitude, whether it is a feature of Saturn. More recently in this outstanding image by Aussie amateurs, Daryl Milliken and Pat Nicholas, there was, in 2018, there was a bright storm that was visible right near the poles. And here you can also see the polar hexagon and its vertices. As you can imagine, seeing these things does require good resolution. And off, hot off the press, we, oh, my computer's just died. Um, sorry. Um, this is a recent image by Trevor Barry and it shows a small storm feature again in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the tick marks are, are Trevor's and some small scale ripples in one of the belts. These are very difficult to image and observe and do require high resolution. Also, uh, one useful thing, if you get a number of images taken on the same night, it's quite good to animate these such as Trevor's done here, because it sometimes helps identify small features that are probably not immediately obvious, but move with the rotation of the planet. So realistically, big storms on Saturn are really the province of the larger amateur telescopes. Some can be seen with 200 millimeter aperture instruments if the conditions are good and the storms are bright enough. However, there are occasions when storms can be visible even with quite small telescopes. And these are often called great white spots um, because they appear as bright spots on Saturn. But the terminology berates their size really because they're actually huge planetary sized storms. This one occurred in 2010, 2011 and caused a lot of disruption around the planet. Uh, there was a lot of atmospheric um, turbulence in the planet, dark features started to form and so on. And it was an, a major event for Saturn observers. But this was visible, certainly in its early stages when it's bright, with nothing more than an 80 mil refractor. 
I've included this image by John Sussenbach because this was taken only with 127 millimeter aperture telescope and shows this storm very well. And it shows you what you can do, and this is older technology now, it's nearly 10 years old technology, by imaging Saturn, even with a relatively small aperture telescope. Six of these great white spot storms have been identified so far over the last sort of 100 years plus. And they have a, a similar characteristic. They start off as a very bright spot. They produce dirt disturbances that go all the way around the planet at the spot's latitude. And often as not can be seen in quite small instruments. Certainly the most famous is this one discovered by Will Hay. And here's an image of one, uh, a drawing made by uh, an expert uh, planetary drawer, David Gray, in 1990. And this was well observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this one by expert imager Damien Peat shows the storm that occurred in 2011, which I've already talked about. And this is the bright centre of the storm. And it was also observed by the Cassini spacecraft, which was in orbit around the planet. And again, Cassini found evidence that this was an absolutely gigantic thunderstorm, which was producing disturbances in the atmosphere. One interesting thing about these storms, actually, if I just go back to the previous slide, you'll notice that they're either in the northern hemisphere or the equatorial range. And this plot shows the date of occurrence of these six storms. This is days from the northern hemisphere spring equinox to the northern hemisphere autumnal equinox. And you'll notice that the majority occur in the northern hemisphere's autumn. The most recent one occurred in the Northern Hemisphere spring. Whether that is significant or not, I don't know, because if that hadn't happened, uh, we would be probably expecting a big storm occurring now-ish or maybe over the next couple of years, but we just don't know. What causes this violent con uh, convection is really one down to the atmospheric physicists, and certainly there are a number of models around now that try and predict why these storms occur roughly one Saturnian year apart. And I don't even pretend to understand the physics, but certainly one of the things is that the atmosphere cools a bit, may remain stable, but then convection arises and punches through the water layer, which is supposed to exist a few hundred kilometers down in Saturn's atmosphere. And water um, going from, uh, releases quite a bit of energy when it changes state. So that might be one of the mechanisms that causes these incredible violent thunderstorms on Saturn. But even if you can't see any storm features on Saturn, Saturn has a number of sat satellites that can be seen with amateur instruments. Currently, I think Saturn has been identified to have 82 satellites now. And certainly, conditions, and I know from my own experience, a good 150 mil aperture telescope will show five of them. However, if you're observing with planet low down, you may have to go to a larger telescope to see some of the fainter ones, say 20 or 25 centimetres aperture. The brightest is Titan, uh, and this image is one that was taken a few nights ago with a colour camera. The colours have been inverted, so black has become white, and the reason for this I'll come to in a moment. Uh, the brightest satellite is Titan, and they're certainly not as bright as the satellites of Jupiter. And Titan is about eight and a half magnitude, but again, should be visible in a relatively small telescope. Again, from last year when the planet was lower, I could see this quite easily in bad conditions with a 90 mil telescope. Titan and all the other satellites, uh, the inner satellites to Saturn, orbit Saturn very close to the plane of the rings. So their apparent uh, positions on the sky resemble larger ellipses of Saturn's rings. And certainly the inner ones, the next brightest one is Rhea, and fainter ones, Tethys and Dionys, are probably easier to spot when the greatest elongation from the planet itself. The rings being wide open are very bright. They produce a little bit of glare around the planet. And some of the inner satellites are a little bit easier to see when the ring angles are a little bit lower. If you're interested in imaging uh, or got a larger telescope, you may be able to pick up some of the even more innermost satellites, such as here with Enceladus and Mimas. Perhaps the most interesting of the five that may be seen, Titan, Rhea, Tethys and Dionysus, is satellite Iapetus, which is shown here. 
And this has one part of one hemisphere is much darker than the rest. So as it goes round Saturn, taking just under 80 days to go round, when it's at, on the preceding side, the western side of the planet, it is a lot brighter than it does on the eastern side of Saturn. This satellite wanders quite away from Saturn, up to about 400, 450 arc seconds. So you do need charts to find it. Also, sometimes we see a star in the field of view as well. But one thing this image does take, and it was deliberately taken with a colour camera and reversed, you'll notice that uh, the red side, it's spread out into a little spectrum. It wasn't so obvious with a black background, but what was blue has now become red and what is red has now become blue. And it shows that this is a little spectrum. This is this atmospheric disturbance effect. And Martin will describe how to get round this very shortly. As I said, there are stars sometimes pop into the field of view of Saturn. So how can you identify what satellites you are looking at? Certainly the BAA handbook has charts for Titan. We sometimes see these in some of the magazines, which show, and a, there is a scale on this as well, and it shows the position of uh, Titan at no hours UT on a number of dates and on a position night, which is the 20th, 21st, this will be the position of Titan. Also includes similar charts for Apetus, but uh, all the other satellite positions are in tabular form, which requires a little bit of calculation. Far more convenient is to use some software. And certainly amongst amateur and even some professional planetary observers, the WinDupos so software has become rather legendary. It's very, very good indeed. What's nice about it is a freeware download. This software does a lot of things in terms of you can do image measurement, you can do uh, some measure of image processing. And we haven't got time to go into all the functionality of WinDupos, but it's got a really excellent ephemeris section, which covers not only Saturn, but all the planets, plus the moon, plus the sun. And you can type in your location, date and time of observation, and it will bring up information such as, and your longitude, it bring up information about planet rise, planet set, its position in the sky, its magnitude, etc. But it's also got a nice graphics uh, visualization of the position of all the satellites. And we saw that Titan was over here in the BA handbook. This is where it is now. It gives a representative view of Saturn. It's not probably one you'll see. And also shows a number of the fainter satellites, including Hyperion. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can change the orientation. You can have south at the top, north at the top, or allow if you're using a star triangle where you get an erect image, but the image is actually uh, mirror image le left to right. So this is a really good piece of software. And perhaps the only thing it doesn't do is show field stars and put an eyepiece field of view around it. But there are many planetarium pieces of software that will do this. Some will cost you money to download, but certainly one that I personally am really enjoying to use is the freeware software called Stellarium. I personally still get the use of this, but again, you can bring up the position of the satellites. And this is again an opposition night. Here we can see Titan again out on the following side. It also shows some of the very faint satellites, which with amateur telescopes you probably haven't got a cutting hell's chance of, of seeing. So this is something else you can do with a small telescope. At least pick up maybe Titan and maybe a couple of the fainter ones as well. But even if you haven't got a telescope, maybe just got the naked eye or binoculars, you can still enjoy finding Saturn because we've seen earlier, Saturn is very close to Jupiter. And often as not, because these planets lie close to ecliptic, other planets may pass close by. And there's an excellent uh, image taken by Andrew Patterson in March earlier this year in the early morning. Simple camera pointed presumably over his house showing Jupiter, Saturn and Mars. Mars is moving eastwards now uh, and out, out the view, but Jupiter and Saturn are still close together. And this is something you take nice pictures with a small camera, digital camera, and sometimes you'll get the moon in the same field of view as well. And sometimes if you've got a guide, you might be able to photograph some of the stars that are behind these two planets. Over the coming months, these two planets are moving westwards as the Earth overtakes them. And then later on in the year, they will, as the Earth moves on, they, this is an apparent motion, they will seem to be moving 
uh, eastwards again, and Jupiter will slowly start to catch up with Saturn. So later on this year, on the 21st, I think the winter solstice, and we've just been past the summer solstice, there will be a very close conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn. And the separation will be about six arc minutes. We're indebted to Steve Harvey from the computing section for confirming the time of closest approach. Six arc minutes is quite small. Uh, the moon's angular size is about half a degree. There is a little bit. So this is about the fifth of the diameter of the full moon. This also apparently is the first closest conjunction 61623. And I think that one was a bit wider. I'm not sure if anybody observed the conjunction in 1623. Certainly telescopes have been invented by that time. So in many ways, you could treat this as a sort of once in a lifetime event. Conjunctions occur in a period of just under 20 years. This is the synodic period between Jupiter and Saturn. And the last one occurred in 2020. It was in the constellation of Aries near solar conjunction. And the next one will be in 2040 in the constellation of Libra. But the separation will be a lot larger than this. So how can we observe this? Well, we've already seen that both Jupiter and Saturn are not particularly high from UK latitudes, certainly from um, other parts of the world that might be a bit uh, higher. But again, this is a simulated view at the time of closest conjunction on the night of the 21st, again, as seen from Birmingham without the light pollution. And these two appear very close together. But at this time, from our Birmingham uh, case study, the altitude will only be about 18 and a half degrees or so. You may be able to pick this up a bit earlier. The sun sets about 1645, 1650, um, sorry, 1545, 15, 1550 from these latitudes. But I certainly don't recommend at all trying to find these while the sun is up. Um, if the sun goes into your optics through your telescope or binoculars, you risk damaging that most wonderful of optical instruments, the naked eye. And it's not worth risking blind, blindness for. Certainly after the sun has set, uh, you may be perhaps an hour, half an hour before this, it might be about 10 degrees high in strong twilight. You may be able to pick these up and they will set in about another hour or so after this. So you're going to have to find a good horizon to find these objects, but certainly in the months running up to this, you'll probably get an idea of where these two planets are setting from your location. On the night itself, well, this shows the picture the night before, and this is one of the simulations you can do um, with Stellarium by putting a telescope, a focal length and an eyepiece in. And this simulates the view through a small 127 millimeter aperture telescope using an eyepiece of about 120. And here we can see Saturn and Jupiter and some field stars here. And on the actual night itself, we can see Jupiter's moved a little bit further on. It's centered on Saturn, so the field stars have moved a little bit uh, westwards. But on the following night, the separation has been increased a little bit and the field stars have moved on. So it does show that in fact, um, it would be nice to see it on the actual night of closest uh, conjunction, but the thing will still remain in the field of view for several nights either side, and particularly the weather can be a bit uh, poor in December. In fact, these are simulations by using a times 50 eyepiece from December the 17th to December the 25th. And again, that you can see they are very close together. So it'd be possible with perhaps small cameras, zoom lenses or through a telescope to take pictures of this conjunction. Hopefully people will be looking and get lots of good pictures on the BAA website. You may find that because there's a disparity between Jupiter and, Bright, uh, Jupiter and Saturn and the satellites, you may have to take uh, exposures for each one and composite them to get uh, a realistic picture. What the press will make of this around this time, particularly it's just before Christmas, I have got absolutely no idea. And what a certain subject that sounds like astronomy and has ology in it, and I refuse to say it because I have to wash my mouth out with soap and water afterwards, will make of this, I don't know. But it will be certainly an interesting event to see. So hopefully there is something observed in Saturn for everybody, even if you've got just a camera and the naked eye and binoculars, a small telescope or a large telescope. 
So any observations? It's always nice to send into the Saturn section. This can be reached by this email address. And whether you've got a large telescope or a small telescope, I think there's something there for everyone to enjoy. But as we've seen earlier, one of the effects of observing at low altitude is this atmospheric dispersion. And I'd now like to hand over to uh, Martin, who's going to show the techniques on how to do this. And then hopefully we can have a question and answer session a bit later on. OK, Andrew, if Martin can take over now, that would be really good. OK. Hi, Mike. Uh, thanks for that. And, uh, hello, uh, all the BAA and non-BAA members who are, are listening. Um, I wanted to talk about a problem that Mike's flagged up there, which is a problem affecting the imaging and visual observation, the visual appearance of low altitude objects and particularly Saturn. So Saturn's going to be badly affected by this issue as it's well south of the celestial equator and will remain so for the next few years. So I will just share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? Yep, that looking good. Yep. Great, okay. So the problem is atmospheric dispersion. So light that hits our atmosphere at a shallow angle is bent by the atmosphere. The atmosphere acts like a, a huge prism, bends the light and actually elevates the object in the sky. And the amount of refraction, the degree of refraction is dependent on the color. So you end up with a stack of colors. Blue is elevated the most and red the least. Uh, this, uh, the degree of elevation is dependent on the altitude. Uh, so the lower it is in the sky, the greater the amount of lift and the greater the amount of separation of the colors. And in fact, you get the same effect with the sun at sunset. So the sun is elevated when it's on the horizon by half a degree, which is its width. So actually, when you see the sun just hitting the horizon, is actually almost completely set at that point. It's elevated by the same as its own diameter. Um, here's a, an image of Polaris, altitude 52 degrees from where I live in St Albans, showing a point of light being spread or the airy disk, uh, which should be whitish being spread and smeared into a spectrum, blue at the top and red at the bottom. And you get the same sort of thing happening with planets. Um, you may think if you're imaging that uh, if you're imaging and creating a color image with separate red, green and blue filters, that all you need to do is just realign the three colors uh, in Registax when you're processing and you'll be able to perfectly recombine the three colors and produce a nice clean image. Um, and that, that can be done to an extent, but the trouble is that you get the, the color filters themselves are not single wavelength. You've got a band of different wavelengths within each color filter, and um, particularly uh, affecting the blue. So you do get dispersion within each color band. So here's a, an image taken um, in 2016. So I've imaged um, Saturn there um, and I haven't aligned the colors on the left hand side. This is an altitude of 17 degrees and you can see the horrible color fringing that you've got there. Um, and that's actually, although you're um, your eye is pretty good at cleaning up the image, you will get that same effect viewing the planet optically. On the right hand side, I've aligned the three colors in Registax and that's got rid of some of the worst color fringing. But you can see particularly um, on the left and right, the Cassini division sharpens up considerably. Um, and then as you move around the ring, you lose it. 
and that's very characteristic of our atmospheric dispersion or you haven't been able to properly correct it in the vertical direction. But fortunately, in recent years, devices have come onto the market, commercial devices, to, uh, to uh, help you with this problem, and they're called atmospheric dispersion correctors. So here's an atmospheric dispersion corrector from a company called Piero Astro in France. There are a number of uh, makes of atmospheric dispersion correctors available from ZWO, Altair Astro, um, Omegan um, Astronomy, um, so, and, and a number of other suppliers as well. Uh, so they used to be quite expensive, three to four hundred pound bracket, but the Chinese have uh, got on the job and now you can pick up one for just over just over a hundred pounds. So how do they work? So at the top here we see um, the light. So we, the light is uh, higher up in the sky for the blue image, lower for the red image. So we've got a divergence there um, and we're imaging here, here we're imaging um, a star and it's split into a spectrum so you get separation um, caused by the atmospheric dispersion. If you introduce two prisms of the correct orientation um, and that the glass in those prisms has got a dispersion effect itself what it will do at the right setting is it will recombine the red and the, the blue image and the colors in between, recombine it and effectively correct for that atmospheric dispersion. Hence the name atmospheric dispersion corrector. So what are the benefits of that? Well, we saw the previous two images where we didn't correct at all in the middle where we aligned the red to the green and the blue in Registax. But on the right hand side, you will see the dramatic improvement in resolution that you can achieve by using an atmospheric dispersion corrector. So all these were taken on the same night, same seeing conditions, same telescope and everything. Um, and you can see particularly, maybe not so much left and right, but at the top and the bottom, a dramatic improvement in the amount of resolution that an atmospheric dispersion corrector will, will bring you. So these devices aren't just for imaging, although that's probably their major use. They will give a significant improvement um, on Saturn opposition uh, with visual use. So visual observers, um, they just go just in front of the eyepiece there. Um, that it does help to put a Barlow in there because you will um, you'll need extra in focus because of the physical length of the atmospheric dispersion corrector. So having a Barlow first, then the atmospheric dispersion corrector, and then probably a lower power eyepiece than you would normally use because you're using a Barlow, uh, and you will be able to correct for the atmospheric dispersion by tweaking the levers until you minimize the color fringing. So here we see an image taken last year. So uh, two years after the previous set, showing the same sort of thing, color, bad color fringing, aligning the color channels, and then at the bottom, uh, use an atmospheric dispersion corrector and I still align in auto stacker, align the color channels just in case there's any slight residual uh, color fringing in there, but you can see that dramatic improvement. So this year uh, from 50, 52 degrees north, uh, the maximum altitude of Saturn is 16 and a half degrees, climbing slightly over the coming years, but still pretty low in the sky um, up until 20, 25, 2026, 20, really. So this is the image that Mike showed earlier. Um, so this was at an altitude of 16 degrees. Um, does show Encke's division there. Uh, would have been completely impossible without the use of an atmospheric dispersion corrector. Um, and actually is 
even though it's only 16 degrees, it's probably the best image uh, I've taken of Saturn. Um, so there you are. Um, hopefully that will encourage you to splash out some money and buy an atmospheric dispersion corrector for the Saturn opposition this year. Just wonder, are there any questions on atmospheric dispersion correctors or, or in general? We've got general? a few questions coming up, coming up now, Martin, some on Excellent. ABC, some on not. Okay. Uh, maybe we can run through them together. The first one is from Lynn, evening Lynn. It says, is there any useful observation work an amateur can do if not an imager and having only a modest telescope, so an 18th Smith Cassegrain or less? Well, certainly some of the storms require larger telescopes, but you never know. And one of the things that we as amateurs have in abundance is time. And we can do lots of things with the time and you never know Sometimes some storm could erupt, it could be a bright one, which is not seen by anybody else, but you're observing uh, and just happen to pick it up. Certainly on Saturn, there may be long gaps between big storms, uh, but it's still worth having a look. And the other thing is, is enjoyment. I mean, we observe because we enjoy it, we find it interesting. So certainly I would continue to observe as much as you can. Uh, the second one is from James Dawson. Evening, James. Uh, he makes a comment that 1624, uh, 1623 conjunction was not observed through a telescope, according to uh, an old uh, journal of the BAA. Uh, I must have confessed I haven't come across this one. So he, he does say this is likely to be the closest observed image with a telescope. So perhaps saying it's a once in a lifetime event is not too far from the truth. Next question is from Jack, and this is really for, for you, um, Martin. ADC, is this what Newton did with his pr prisms? Um, as, well, I mean, it uses a prism. You use a, a thin prism um, and the dispersion properties of a prism um, to cancel out the dispersion properties of the atmosphere. So it does use... It, 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 it effectively reverses the dispersion of the uh of the our atmospheres uh of the dispersion of the atmosphere so it does rather than separating the light um you're using it you're using the it to reverse the separation that's already occurred so yes it, it, in a way it's it's the same thing that uh, newton demonstrated Okay, it's another one for you, Martin. Can a power mate be used instead of a Barlow lens in front of the ADC? Yes. Yes, you use a, a power mate just the same as a, as a Barlow. No issues with that. Okay. Uh, is, and this one is from Diane. Is Saturn as active in the radio spectrum as Jupiter? It's not as active, but it still has a, a magnetic field which interacts with some of the other features and has radio, uh, radio spectra as well. In fact, uh, one of the instruments on Cassini was a radio plasma experiment, which they were hoping to investigate the radio field around Saturn. But it picked up these bursts, which, given their energy, the scientists decided were radio emissions from them storms I mentioned, the one with lightning bolts indicating that these storms were thunderstorms. And these have been, when Cassini was there, picked up a lot of these things. In fact, with the great storm that occurred uh, in 2010, 2011, the lightning bolts went on, were picked up over a period of about 250 days or so. So it does have a radio spectrum. Um, this one is for you, Martin, um, is from Lillian. Are there any tools that help you know when the ADC is set correctly? <laughs> um... <laughs> The best, there are a number of ways of setting up an ADC. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's too long an issue to go into here. Um, but if you go to my, so I've got a website and one of my most popular pages is about the atmospheric dispersion corrector. Um, so if you go to skyinspector.co.uk and go to equipment under there you will find atmospheric dispersion corrector and there's a whole page there everything you want to know about atmospheric 
dispersion correctors and probably a lot you never wanted to know about atmospheric dispersion correctors but in there are various methods for setting the atmospheric dispersion corrector um, you can do it by eye you know uh, just playing with the levers until you minimize the color fringing that's quite easy to do and that's a method i often use or you can do it with a color camera um, just minimizing the fringing and setting the preview screen to give you a saturated, a very saturated image so that you can see small amounts of color fringing. Or you can use um, a mono camera and use what's called a Rattan 47 filter and um, use the fact that it allows infrared through and violet light and you just move the levers until the infrared um, image of a star at the same altitude as the object you're observing and the violet image come together and you've minimized the dispersion. So the dispersion depends on the altitude. So you need to pick a star that's the same altitude as the planet you're, uh, you're imaging. Um, I do prefer um, methods where you're actually um, setting up the ADC on the planet itself because then you know it's at the right altitude. But yeah, do, do visit that website and, um, and, and visit my page about atmospheric dispersion correctors. Next one is from Lillian Hobbs. Evening Lillian, it's really a question probably for both of us actually. Where is the option in AutoStack it to allow, allow the frames? Well, in AutoStack it, there's probably three major uh, command buttons. One that opens the file, which brings the file into AutoStack it. You can then press the analysis button that uh, tries to identify which frames are of higher quality than the others. And then you can select how many frames you want to stack, add in some um, alignment points, and then in the command menu, right at the bottom right hand corner, uh, certainly on the version that I've got, there is a stack button which actually allows you to stack things directly. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Martin. Yeah, and there's also a box that says RGB align. Yeah. that I think by default isn't ticked. I don't know if that's changed yeah, it isn't, now. It isn't. Um, so it's worth ticking that. And then if you've got a color stream that's being um, processed, it will align the red, the green and the blue um, as part of the stacking process. But if you forget to do that, uh, when you do your wavelet processing and registacks that most people do to... Um, boost the contrast and pull out the fine detail, um, you can do an RGB align in Registax as well. There's another question from James Dawson. Hello again, James. Really one for you, Martin. Will the ADC settings be same for both planets when imaging the Great Conjunction? Yes. Yes. If, it, if it's the same altitude, um, I mean, they're essentially the same altitude. So yes, they'll be the same. So it's, uh, quite, it's, quite, it's quite handy. A lot of these ADCs have um, graduations on the side. And if you make a note of, you know, how many graduations the levers are at, if you observe at a similar time the next night, the lever settings will be very similar. So you can just set it up um, pretty much the same. Okay, we've got another ADC question from Stefan Croes. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, Stefan. Uh, the ADC needs to be orientated to the horizon. Is this done visually? And are there any tricks to ensure the correct orientation? <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is a, a, a nice one. So if you have got a refractor and you're not using any diagonal um, or an SCT and you're not using any diagonal, then the midpoint of the two levers should be horizontal with the ground. As soon as you put a diagonal in there or you're using a Newtonian or something like that um, it's not obvious the correlation between horizontal as seen through the eyepiece and horizontal to the ground so um, what I do on my Newtonians because I use a Dobsonian horizontal um, as seen through the eyepiece doesn't change much um, so I have a mark on the side of the focuser and I just align the midpoint of the two levers 
level with that position and I know that's um, either side of horizontal as seen through the eyepiece. Um, if you've got a Newtonian on an equatorial mount then the horizon as seen through the eyepiece is not defined um, and that's that that makes life quite difficult but you can do things like um, take the ADC out um, look through the barlow put a star out of focus and then put say uh, a, a broomstick horizontally in front of the telescope you have that horizontal then when you look down the barlow um, and see the out of focus star image you will see where horizontal is you'll see you know aligned at 45 degrees to the horizon or 60 degrees or whatever but uh, yeah there are a few tricks um, to setting up an ADC. Not only do you need the, light, the right lever settings, so the magnitude of dispersion, but you need to align it um, so the midpoint is horizontal as seen through the eyepiece. So um, parallel with the horizon as seen with the eyepiece. Next two questions are very similar. One that's signed admin and one from Simon Street. And it really says, if we're buying an ADC, how well can we tell a good one from a bad one? And are there any ones to avoid? And are any cheaper ones just as good? Um, <laughs> that's a difficult question. I mean, <laughs> I've tested a few ADCs and they've all performed very well. Um, people do question the quality control from particularly Chinese low-cost products but I've not seen any issues um, if you spend a lot of money you're probably more guaranteed of the quality control but I mean I, I've used a couple of ZWO ADCs and been very impressed with them they're low cost um, Altair do a a reasonable one as well um yeah i've not i've not i've not heard of problems with adcs but you know like anything um you can get rogue rogue ones uh circulating mm. this one you can have a go first and i may comment on it it's another uh, question from james dawson what tips can you get on how to get the best focus when imaging saturn so low in the sky um so I presume, yeah, so imaging. So you, there are various ways of imaging, of, of setting the focus with planets. The one I use is just to um, look at the screen and just go through focus one way. Um, so you go out the focus the other side, you come through focus to the other side of focus, just to get a feel for what an in-focus image is like. And then you've got to go back and try and hit that point. Um, it's difficult. Focus, often when the seeing is poor, the focus is moving around a lot. Um, and it's hard to know whether you're actually at optimum focus. And is there really, you know, a best focus position if it's moving around? Um, the better the seeing, the easier it is to focus. Um, but that's, that's the way that... Uh, that I would focus and I often will I'll focus run a couple of videos and then I'll reset the focus again and it, obviously if you stick with one focus for your whole session and you've you've not got the optimum um, you've lost out but if you're constantly changing the focus um, every few videos then hopefully you will get some of the videos where the focus is good but doing it on screen and using an electric focuser I think if you're manually focusing, then you're on a hiding for nothing. It's very, very difficult to do that manually um, and concentrate what's on the screen at the same time and be able to move it, move it incrementally. My, my focus, electric focuser, I have a, uh, a, an audible, um, uh, I have a, a small loudspeaker connected to it. So I hear the clicks as the focus changes so I get a that's audible feedback, and that's an important part of uh, of tuning in. But it is it's a skill to be learned, really. 
can only emphasize that it's just going in and out and uh, trying to get the best you can and sometimes i think that maybe the telescope focus may change a little bit throughout yeah. the night as well yes yeah. on my own one which is quite an old one there is a, a digital readout and uh, you can get an idea where where you think the best focus is but sometimes as you say it's probably best to keep repeating the process can be time consuming it's worth getting it right yes there's another one uh, there's another question really um for you again martin uh, uh john axtell evening john i've heard there's a bit of a learning curve with adcs how long would you think was a reasonable amount of time to learn to use them <laughs> um well i would have thought um you know two or three sessions and you've probably got most of it mastered really um just probably the hardest thing is getting the horizontal knowing where the horizontal is and getting the midpoint of the two levers um, aligned with that horizontal and then just use an eyepiece look through it and move the levers equally either side of horizontal you move one lever clockwise and the other le lever anti-clockwise <coughs> and if it gets worse then move them in the other direction um, until the colour fringing is minimised. I should say there is something that may catch you out, and that's that if you've got the levers on, um, so you can either have you can have the levers either side of horizontal on on the left, or either side of horizontal on the right, and uh, one setup where when you increase the levers will correct the atmospheric dispersion. If you've got them on the wrong side, it will make the atmospheric dispersion worse. So if you find it getting, you know, from zero, you see the fringing, and as you increase the the settings, it just gets worse. Then rotate the whole thing by 180 degrees and try again. So I have heard of atmospheric dispersion correctors, you know, where even from the same manufacturer, you can get righties and lefties. <laughs> Um, which uh, yeah will we'll, we'll throw you if you're not if you're not familiar with that uh, particular pitfall. Uh, there's a comment really from David R. Ditty who said there's a very tool, good tool in fire capture for setting the ADC which I've only discovered this morning. Um, I don't know if you know anything about that Martin but certainly the yes. everywhere software fire capture is a really good tool for controlling cameras during imaging. Yeah so yeah fire capture I use all the time brilliant um the adc setting tool i'm not so enamored with um and i've had long conversations with torsten edelman about you know possible tweaking to that method i still much prefer the color tinge method where you whack up the saturation and the exposure time on the camera and just adjust the levers until the color fringing is minimized um yeah, the, the, the fire capture method, there's a couple of methods that he's got in there, but uh, I still prefer the colour tinge method. Next to, I'm not sure if this question is one from John Axtell. It says, I'm oh, sorry, forgot to sign in. And somebody called Jack, what camera is that? I don't know if you want to repeat the question, either of you, because I don't quite make giving sense. Uh, so a question from a, an old friend of mine, Gary Gawthorpe. Uh, good to hear from you, Gary. Um, Gary asks, if you have an ADC and a Barlow power mate, what order gives the best result? Um, good question. So traditionally, you should have the Barlow before the ADC. Um, but there are <coughs> reasons to have it the other way around. Um, because it increases the uh, increasing the distance between the ADC and the camera increases the amount of correction. So there is an issue that some observers, some images may find is that they run out of correction on the atmospheric dispersion corrector, um, particularly with larger telescopes. So I actually have a, um, so the the prisms in an ADC are usually two and a half degree deflection prisms. So I have um, an older version of 
my main ADC is an older version and it's got two two degree prisms, but I add a third prism in front, a fixed prism that isn't adjustable to add another two degrees. So I can vary it from effectively two times two degrees for the two prisms I've got in there, um, plus two degrees so I can go up to six degrees. Um, but that would be a reason for putting it the other way around, um, having the, the Barlow um, after the ADC would be to increase the amount of correction. There's a lot of discussion about um, the fact that if you use a, an ADC um, at too low an F ratio, you get all sorts of aberrations. Um, but I've got a sister page on my website, um, uh, ADCs2, where uh, Optical um, Supremo as Reed did loads of calculations, uh, ray tracing calculations for ADCs. Mm -hmm. And um, we came to the conclusion that all that mattered was the altitude of the object really, as to the amount of aberration, not where the Barlow went. So, um, so just experiment. Um, it, it's it would be very unusual for the ADC to make it worse than the than the atmospheric dispersion um, uh, causes deterioration of the planet. It, it, it invariably will make it better. Okay, I think we've answered this one, but it's, we've answered it from Simon, but he's repeated again because he thought he had a typo. But it's worth having a crack again. Right. Are there better ADCs and some ADCs to avoid, and are the cheaper ones just as good? I think you've answered this. Before. Yeah, I think we've answered that, haven't we, really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we've got another one. It's another one on ADCs from Miguel Hejo. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Does the ADC introduce astigmatism? Yes, yes, it will. And the higher the setting to compensate for the atmospheric dispersion, the worse the astigmatism. So that's, you know, as I say, go to my second page. So if you see the link on here, second page, click on that. And it's all about um, aberrations introduced by atmospheric dispersion correctors. And that's one thing that um, I am planning to do over the next few months is to do some, uh, get some empirical data, some real data using atmospheric dispersion correctors at different settings to, um, and, and produce images showing um, the aberration introduced by the atmospheric dispersion corrector at different settings. So stay tuned, I will update that web page once I get some results on there. Sounds like we need a webinar on atmospheric dispersion correctors, doesn't it? I think we do, actually. <laughs> um, and I mean, certainly as um, we've got Jupiter and Saturn now, we've got Uranus and Neptune opposition in a few months' time, the big Mars opposition coming up in October. And then we've got Venus in the morning sky. There will be various altitudes. So probably what we've discussed so far is not only just on Saturn, but for all the planets Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've got a question from Jack. It says, what camera is attached to the power mate on your sky inspector screen? To me, it looks like an imaging source camera, Martin, yes. but maybe you can confirm yes, that. Yes, uh, yeah, it's one of my old DMK imaging source yeah. cameras. Yes, yeah. I sold that a long time ago. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've got a comment, another comment from David, David Arditi. Uh, he says, I found for a C14 and Piero Astro ADC without a Barlow lens between the ADC and the camera, the maximum correction is not quite enough for 16 degrees altitude. Right. Okay. So, yes, um, you can increase the, the distance between <coughs> the ADC and the camera, and that will increase the amount of correction. So that's one thing you can do. Um, there's three or four different things you can do. And again, on my website, I discuss um, various strategies for um, tackling that problem because, yeah, I think a lot of ADCs are sort of running out around about 15 degrees, really, mm -hmm. um, 15, 20 degrees, especially on the bigger telescopes like a C14. Mm -hmm. But there are some strategies that you can use 
particularly increasing the distance between the ADC and the camera. Okay. Um, there was a question which came in on the chat, which was from Diane. Um, and it was on one of Mike's later slides. I think he was looking at the altitude of Saturn. She was asking if it was 18.5 rather than it was shown as 8.5 degrees. On the 8.5 the 8 one, I believe, was the uh, for when we're looking at Saturn, just at the great conjunction. I'll have to bring my screen up to do that. But at that case, uh, the maximum altitude when it's on the meridian would be about 18. But as we're getting towards sunset, if, 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 it's, a, if it's a later slide that uh, does, uh, I'll just check, I'll, I'll just bring it up on my machine. I think um, I think I think you misspoke, um, Mike, when you were presenting it, and you said eighteen point five. Oh, it is eight point five. Even apologize. though it said eight point five on the screen. Yeah, I do apologise because at that at that time of the year, the the um, the altitude will be quite low. But let me just double check. I can just bring that up on my yeah, screen. Should I, should I stop sharing? Probably me just jumping ahead a little bit. But the thing, yes, it is. Uh, so look. Yeah, I probably did miss, it is 8.5, that's for when um, it was getting close to sunset with the, with the conjunction, so I probably just missed, said it. Any other questions coming in, Andy? I've got as far as David's last question live, and that seems to be on the q and I don't think the, I think that's it for the uh, questions. Oh, actually, uh, one's just come in from Jack. Which is to Martin, how do you rate point grey cameras? Um, I don't have a lot of experience with point grey cameras. I have got one point grey camera um, that I used for a uh, thousand nanometer imaging of Venus recently. Um, but uh, generally, I use the ZWO cameras. Um, and I've got a, a collection of those, but uh, you know, the, the point gray are very well thought of. Um, they use a lot of the, a lot of the modern planetary imaging cameras use Sony chips. Um, they're really at the forefront of uh, uh, CMOS um, sensors really for planetary imaging cameras in terms of speed, um, noise level, resolution, and quantum efficiency. Um, so yeah, they make some great cameras, Point Grey uh, and ZWO. They're probably the, the, the big two um, mm. that are out there. Certainly images coming into the section, there are quite a few from some of the very experienced images use Point Grey cameras. I certainly have got no experience myself. My experience is just limited to imaging source and ZWO, but I'm certainly pleased with the ZWO cameras and um, they seem to work very well with high frame rates, uh, assuming you've got the, the laptop that can accommodate them. Any others come in, Andy? Uh, my, my question screen is blank, blank now. No, and I've checked YouTube and there's nothing which has come in on YouTube. So um, I think that's it for the uh, questions. Okay. So uh, thank you very much to Mike and Martin, a very informative, and interesting uh, talk on Saturn, as well as um, atmospheric dispersion correctors, which I'm sure uh, will help a lot of people in the UK, given um, the, the altitude of the planets at the moment. It's always worth right. observing. <laughs> and it might be clear tonight for many of us in the UK. It's looking good. <sighs> Indeed. Um, and just uh, for next week's Wednesday webinar, we've got uh, Jeremy Shears back, the director of the BAA Variable Star Section. And this time we'll be talking about is SS Cygni losing the plot, observing unusual outbursts in a well-known dwarf nova. I look forward to that and hope to see uh, many of you there next week. Thanks all for joining us and um, see you in a week. Bye. Thank you. Cheers, bye. Cheers, bye. Cheers, bye.